if you strike a tuning fork, right, it produces a sound. This is demonstrating the connection between simple harmonic motion and waves. How is that happening? Let's take a closer look. Zoom in on just one single prong, the bottom one, let's say. That bottom prong has a little bit of flex, so it bends down and then bends up. If we zoom in, the picture looks like this. Initially, it's right in the middle, but then it bends down, and then it bends back to the middle, and then it bends up and it oscillates back and forth with simple harmonic motion. So where's the connection to waves? Well, whenever that prong pushes down, oscillates down, it's pushing down against air particles, and it's scrunching them all up. Right? And then, when it, subsequently, uh, when it subsequently moves back up, it kind of leads a vo it leaves a void there's not many air particles here because they just got all they all just got pushed down and scrunched up. So what has this picture shown? It's showing a sound wave. There's a compression here and a rarefaction or expansion right there. Sound waves are exactly that. They are waves of compression and rarefaction. In other words, we could express we could draw a sound wave as a slinky with a compression and an expansion, compression, expansion. It is longitudinal, as we say, because it has ex uh, compressions and rarefactions. The alternative wave is a transverse wave, which doesn't have compressions and rarefactions. It has crests and troughs. Sound is longitudinal, not transverse. Okay. Compressions and rarefactions. So what's the connection between the tuning fork, which oscillates with simple harmonic motion, and the sound wave? Well, it's just this. Objects in simple harmonic motion can be the, uh, can be the source or can produce waves, like sound waves. So what happens when you strike that tuning fork? Now we know. What happens is this. You produce a series of compressions in the air, right, like that followed by rarefactions. In the rarefactions, there's this nice kind of continuous change from compression to rarefaction. So compression followed by rarefaction, followed by compression, followed by rarefaction. So I'm going to take a moment and fill in the picture. OK, so I finished my wave. There it is. And again, the dots here represent, they represent particles of air. I've taken a snapshot of the air at one moment, right? I looked at my watch, I waited for it to hit noon, and then I took a picture of the, of the air. And this is what I see when I inspect the picture. There are compressions, places where air is all scrunched up, and rarefactions, places where the air is expanded. And when I look at the air, I see the pattern repeating, right? Compressions and rarefactions. Now I'm going to switch for a moment to a, whoops, to a string. Imagine you take a string like this, and you shake it up and down so that you produce these waves. The crests and troughs move across the medium. They move, they move forward. What's the analogy for air? We don't have crests and troughs, but we do have expansions and rarefactions. I'm sorry, <laughs> we have compressions and rarefactions. Like that. And the same way that the crests move forward, the compressions move through the medium. And the same way that the troughs move along the string, the expansions or rarefactions move through the air. So the location of compressions will change. Okay. And the location of the crests will change. So after a little while, the string will look like this. The wave shape travels forward on the string. And after a little while, the compressions will all be right here. right? That's where it'll be compressed, and it'll be expanded right here, a little farther down. But we've seen already that with a string, we can actually create something called a standing wave. A standing wave is what you get when the crests and troughs don't move. They stay in the same location. So the standing wave first will look like that, and then after a little time, 
it looks like this. Have I done it well? Hmm. After a little time, it looks like this. Right, the compressions, I'm sorry, the crests are still at the same place as they were before, and the troughs are still at the same place. We can produce a standing wave in air, and the exact same thing happens. The compressions always stay right here. They don't move forward. So it looks like the wave is just standing there. Okay. Now, in order to produce a standing wave on a string, let me take this away, you need to have two boundaries or ends of the string. Why do you need boundaries? Because a standing wave is formed when you have an incident wave interfering with a reflection. You won't make a reflection in the first place without a boundary. And then, in order to keep the standing wave going, you need the reflection here to be reflected again. And you need this one to be reflected again so that you always have that interference between two oppositely traveling waves. So you need two boundaries. And when you have two boundaries, you can trap a wave and its reflection on a medium, on a string, so that they continually interfere to produce a standing wave. So here we've trapped it. We have two ends to the string. How do we trap air? How do we trap those waves? Well, what we use is a pipe. Our pipe can be open at one end or, uh, or open at both ends. Open at one end or open at both ends. When I say open at one, I mean also closed at one end. So here's a pipe closed at one end. We've, in, we've seen this already. Okay. Um, it's pretty obvious that if you strike a tuning fork, right? ring, um, the sound wave comes in, and it travels down, and then it's going to bounce off of that end, right? But doesn't it just escape? Doesn't it just go out? Well, the answer is no, believe it or not. When it reflects off of the closed end, it travels through the length of the pipe, and then it reflects again at the open end. Open ends of pipes serve as places of, refle of refle uh, reflection. Right? And that's going to be weird, but it's true. You always have reflection any time a wave bounces on at the interface, the interface between two media. So let's say you have water and air. If a light wave comes in, it will be able to bounce off of that uh, interface between the two. Right? What's the interface? It's the interface between two different media, air and water. Now, if, on the other hand, you have pipe air and open air, you still get an interface between two different media. Pipe air constitutes different air or a different medium from open air because the pipe air is confined and the open air is not. So there's an, an interface right there at the boundary and those waves reflect. We can trap them inside the pipe. That's the takeaway. So if we can trap air, um, if we can trap those sound waves, right, we're trapping both the incident wave and the reflection, and then the reflection bounces off and becomes the incident, the incident bounces off and becomes the reflection, if we can trap them, then we can potentially produce a standing wave. Why do I say potentially? Well, standing waves have boundary conditions. The boundary conditions we've seen already, for a pipe that is open at just one end, we need to have a node at the closed end, and you need to have an anti-node at the open end. Right? Now we, oh gosh, we really don't want to have to draw air particles in here, right? like compressions and expansions. That's getting really annoying by now. Um, so instead, we cheat. We say, okay, compressions, which are like, here's a bunch of lines compressed, and here's an expansion, and then here are the lines compressed, and there's an expansion, and they get compressed again. Compressions uh, and expansions, we're just going to take that. Let's see. It would look actually more like this. We're just going to take it and represent it using a sine curve, using a transverse wave. We're changing longitudinal into transverse okay, because transverse are easier to draw. Um, and the way this, transver this conversion works, every compression is where particles can't move. That's a node. And likewise, it turns out, 
The rarefactions are where particles can't move. So the rarefactions are nodes as well. So here's another compression, that's a node. Here's a rarefaction, that's a node. Compression is a node. Particles located at the compressions and rarefactions don't move. So the wave we would represent this way. Let me make that conversion on this picture on the left. Compression, 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 rarefaction, rarefaction. Those are the nodes. That's where we are at the center line. Ooh, my, my wave is not very evenly spaced. That's OK. All right. So at a displacement node, particles pile up. Right here, particles are piling up on both sides. And the one right in the middle doesn't move because it's being pushed equally on both sides. So now take and draw that sign shape in the pipe. Okay, we're starting at a node, and we're going to an antinode, which means we're going from like right here to right here. And the simple shape we put is this. Right? We're just representing this part in the pipe. OK. So only when that boundary uh, condition is satisfied, do we actually get a standing wave? So con consider the following situation. You take a tuning fork and you strike it above water. Okay. Then you take a pipe, and the pipe could be, for all we care, it could be open at both ends. But we're going to dip it in the water. When we dip it in the water, it might as well now be a pipe which is open at just one end. Any air that tries to bounce off of that um, off of that water surface, it can't move. So this acts like a wall. It acts like a pipe closed at one end because the air can't bump into that. It can't bounce. Uh, sorry, it can't move. Right? It's pushed against that end and it can't move. So sound waves will travel down, and they will bounce off of that end where the air is fixed, where the air can't move. And so the water acts like a closed end for the pipe, because, it, uh, because that's a place where the air can't move. If the air can't move, then that is a node. Right? Displacements, uh, where, where the displacement is zero, those are nodes. So we're going to produce a stand. Uh, sorry, we're going to produce a sound wave like this. And you take your pipe, right? You dip it in. So now there's a closed end, and you raise it up. So let me move the tuning fork over. You raise it up gradually, and you hear that when you get to right there, there's a really loud noise. And then you raise it a little farther, and the noise is not so loud. And then you raise it even farther to right here, and you get a loud noise again. So why do we hear a loud noise when the pipe is right here? Because when the pipe is right here, let me zoom in the picture. When the pipe is right there, we have met the boundary conditions. Right. When the pipe is right there, at that perfect length, what we have is a node here and an antinode right at the open end of the pipe, which is exactly the boundary condition. And then when we raise the pipe up a little farther to, where is it, to right there, when we raise the pipe up to right here, we get another loud noise because we've met the boundary condition. There's a node here, and then the wave shape goes like this, an antinode node, antinode, oops, right. which is pretty cool. So you get these loud noises, these loud sounds, um, where, the, where the standing wave is being formed. The first pipe length, let's call it, let's use red, we'll call that L1, and the second pipe length we will call L2. Right. The difference between L1 and L2, delta L, is this. And delta L is exactly half a wavelength. Okay. From crest to crest is one wavelength, and delta L is from crest to trough. So delta L is half a wavelength. So we, w we will use this fact to solve some problems.